the shock that's tied to contents of consciousness that have not yet been processed. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today we're continuing the Why Do We Read Fiction series with the Uses of Literature, a manifesto by Rita Felsky. This is a very tight, well-written, engaging, dynamic book that I highly recommend to anyone who's interested in where we are today with literary theory in forging the bridge between hardcore literary theorists and those who just read for fun, or another way of saying it is the hardcore canonizers versus popular fiction readers. She takes on just about everybody. And in such uh, a healthy but stimulating and incisive way, I saw that she is a professor at the University of Virginia, and after reading this, I would love to be her student. She says that I hold fast to the view that any account of why people read must operate on several different fronts, that we should relinquish once and for all the pursuit of a master concept, a key to all the mythologies. And I note that cool middle March allusion, especially as with our Heather Cass White episode, we got into some uh, Middle March. I really need to do a video on Middle March. And she just puts it bluntly in her introduction. If literary studies is to survive the 21st century, it will need to reinvigorate its ambitions and its methods by forging closer links to the study of other media rather than clinging to ever more tenuous claims to exceptional status. Now, I want to say that when I first read that, it hurt me to hear, and I've heard it before, but, you know, and I, I also don't make money off of literary studies. I, you know, I, I'm not a full-time teacher in an English department somewhere, and so I'm not enmeshed in all of these goings on. Indeed, my situation, my outlook would be much different because I can't imagine being in there and like Felsky is saying, seeing the stuff that I cling to so dearly fading away, you know, funding getting taken away, um, enrollment quotas not being met, and then seeing the film studies department, for example, completely thrive and flourish. And yet, to a large degree, even someone like myself, I'm so indebted to and dependent on the, the, these fading uh, luminaries of literary studies in the university. So many books that I read come because of some scholar resurrecting them or a university press printing them. And so there's a part of me that hurts a little bit to know that the world is changing and you know getting away from sitting quietly with ink on a page. But all this to say that Felsky is bringing a much different perspective than we saw with, say, Heather Cass White, who's also in academia, by the way. And it's always good to have these dialectics. One thing Felsky definitely wants to do is sort of dismantle the rhetoric that's built up around aesthetics, around literary appreciation, something that I cling desperately to, that I feed on and, and thrive on. And, and this is like the what she means by books, literature in the form of books, having this exceptional, almost sacred and spiritual status that's really untouchable. And she's operating more on a practical level, like, look, while the last people are you know, forming that bastion uh, against literary studies and aesthetics and so on. Uh, everybody else is moving on. And it can be easy for me with where I'm positioned to say, okay, well, that's fine. Let them move on. The, the five of us will stay back here and, and live off of this, you know. 
And she says, film will soon supplant the novel as the medium most often accused of lulling its viewers into a trance-like fascination with unreal worlds. And things like that, that, that's something that I really have to grapple with. I personally have not had that experience. My best experiences have been with books. Of course, she's talking about the masses. And that's where I realized that I'm part of this group that I do assign an exceptional status to literature. And so Felsky is directly challenging that, directly challenging me. So she looks at the uses of literature from four different lenses. Recognition, enchantment, knowledge, but then she ends with shock. And this is when I realized, oh man, this is something that's missing from the why do we read literature series? Why do we read fiction series? Is the notion of shock, not shock value, like jump scares in a horror movie, but as she defines it, a reaction to what is startling, painful, even horrifying. Applied to literary texts, it connotes something more brusque and brutal than, for example, the idea of Stoss advanced by Heidegger which is the claim that what defines an artwork is its blow to consciousness, its rupturing of familiar frames of reference. In the terms to be canvassed here, shocking is a selective epithet rather than a general synonym for aesthetic estrangement. This got me thinking about Franz Kafka in his 1904 letter saying, I think we ought only to read the kind of books that wound us. Famously, he says, if the book we're reading doesn't wake us up with a blow to the head, what are we reading for? And as I was thinking about this, and again, this is for me in this video and for Felsky, this is set apart from, like I said, like horror movie jump scares and things like that. But it has more to do, I guess, with epiphany and revelation, having our eyes open to a way of living we never knew about, uses of language, I would say uses of syntax, uses of form that are like a blow that kind of stuns us and, and wakes us up. Something we didn't know before has been unveiled to us and it has caused a moment of shock. And when I think back on some of my greatest reading experiences, they are indeed bound up with shock. And I have to admit that much appeal that continues to lead me to continue reading and to even rereading is the experience of shock, yes. But then, especially in terms of rereading, the revisiting of the site of the original shock, investigating why the shock occurred. And I like that she points out towards the end of her chapter on shock that Shock teeters precariously between the threat of two forms of failure, caught between the potential humiliation of audience indifference and the permanent risk of outright and outraged refusal. An aesthetic that assaults our psyches and assails our vulnerabilities turns out to be all too vulnerable to the vagaries of audience response. So it, it is very hard to pin down exactly what is meant by shock in literature and furthermore, what is meant by the shock that I believe Kafka was referring to when he referred to literature that wounds us, that delivers a blow to the head as the only literature worth reading. People are so dynamic and so different that what shocks one may not shock the other. And like Felsky says, if the shock or the attempt at shock is delivered at too low a level, there's going to be a disappointment for the reader and an embarrassment or a falling flat for the writer. Yet if it's too high, it's now in danger of being thrown out the window. And so I think that in terms of shock as the factor of literature that keeps us reading, that keeps us reading fiction. Like everything else, this is always in a state of flux along with our own, with the formation of our own selves. And indeed, what I used to crave in terms of shock 
15 years ago is totally different than what I want today. A lot of the books I read years and years ago wouldn't resonate with me at all today. And indeed, I've tried here and there to go back and read something that was so luminous in my mind and so satisfying and enjoyable. And then it just totally falls flat and seems worn, used. It has already been absorbed by myself and utilized to shape my character. You know, sometimes we, re we read to find out who we are and who we are not, what we like and what we do not like. But shock is also a special factor in its instantiation and articulation in literature versus other forms. Something that was shocking as artwork many years ago, I don't know what kind of artwork it would take <laughs> today uh, to shock our sensibilities, honestly, but you know, the, it's the visual, the, the all at once visual assault. And then with movies, it's a little more complex because you've got the score, the, the music behind it. You've got everything that has already happened leading up to a moment of shock. You've got the, the visual representation and the movement on the screen. You've got the colors, the focal depth or shallowness, lighting. But then with reading, you're again, it's just this ink on paper. It may not be a visual representation, a description, or something a character says necessarily, but it may be an idea that's expressed from the narrator something that's implied, something that's unsaid, but that auditory and visual dimension, those two dimensions are stripped away when we're reading. And I think the, probably the greatest shock we can experience, as Felsky says, is the shock that's tied to contents of consciousness that have not yet been processed. So this would be, she pits this against merely a matter of formal innovation, stylistic subversion, or unconventionality for its own sake. To be honest with you, I, I'm just struggling with this episode, and I'm not the authority here. <laughs> I just happen to host this channel. So I want to open it up and invite you to, in the comments, help expand and articulate this idea of shock in literature in the context of why do we read fiction? What do you think Kafka meant when he said that the only types of fiction worth reading are those that wound us?